This is actually the third in a series on the third angel's message. And I chose to talk about the righteous first. And so we've been looking at the verse. I call this one the third qualification of the 144,000. Because in the beginning of chapter 14, it is telling us about the 144,000. Then it goes into explaining how they get to be that in the three angels' messages. So in verse 12, I found this interesting introduction. It says in the 16th manuscript release, Page 269, John exclaimed in rapture. So, in other words, as he was shown this group of people, he was amazed. And it says that he, he was enraptured. And here's the group he saw. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So we had one study on patience, how God is working to develop patience in us. And the beauty of this passage is it's going to work because John saw them after it was done. Amen. And he saw they were absolutely patient. They, were, they could go in through anything like Job and never complain. Uh, they were fully patient. And the next thing he saw was that they kept the commandments of God not just eight of them, not nine of them, but all ten of them. So many people say, well, you can't keep the commandments. You know, you just have to trust Jesus because you can't keep them. Well, this text says that's not true. Here's a group of people that are keeping the Ten Commandments. And the third one we look at today, that this group of people have kept the faith of Jesus. And that reminded me of another text in Zechariah 3.8 because it's talking about the same group of people and it says they are men wondered at. In other words, it is amazing. It, it is unbelievable. But if God says it can happen, it can happen. Amen. So we have to believe it, not because it's believable, but because God said it. So we're going to look at that part of it today. Let's look first at the value of faith. This woman in the Bible that had the issue of blood and as Jesus was uh, progressing to Jairus' home to, to help his daughter that was sick, this woman touched him. And Jesus said to her, Thy faith hath made thee whole. The reason you're well is because of your faith. And the question that I think is important for us to look at this morning is, are we exercising our faith? Are we getting these kind of results? Are we being made whole? If we are, then faith is present. If we're not being made whole, then faith is not there. That's what this tells us. But that's not the only time. We have a story of the blind man that was crying out to Jesus. And when uh, Jesus spoke to him, he said, Thy faith hath made thee whole. That's in Mark 10, verse 52. And the first one is in Matthew 9, verse 22. Again, we find uh, Mary Magdalene at Simon's house and she is so thankful for the way Jesus has treated her that uh, she wanted to wash his feet in this expensive ointment, which Simon didn't like too well. He questioned about it. But when Jesus spoke about her, he said, Thy faith hath saved thee. So Mary, yes, God has the power, but the faith is what makes it work. And when you believe it, it happens. Amen. Also, uh, 
there was one thankful leper. Jesus actually had the request from ten, and he healed all ten, but there was only one that was thankful. And so when the thankful leper came back to Jesus, Jesus said, Thy faith hath made thee whole. Luke 17, verse 19. So here we see a very common thread. People got what they believed they could have. Now, of course, it has to be based on the promises of God. We can't just ask for anything we think we want. But if we can find a promise in the Word of God that says we can have something, faith is what it will take to get it. And if we don't believe we can have it, we won't have it. And if we do believe we can have it, we will. Faith makes the difference. In Matthew 9, 27 to 30, we have a little longer uh, reading in regard to this matter. Two blind men followed him crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? Now this time, he asks a question before he heals them. And really, it's a test. It could have happened the opposite way. These two men could have gone away still blind. But Jesus asked the question, Believe ye that I'm able to do this? Well, their answer was, they said unto him, Yea, Lord. Or in other words, yes, Lord, we believe. Now, some people think they believe when they're not believing. And if that had been their case, they would have gone away without being able to see. But apparently, they did have faith because it says, Then touched he their eyes, saying, and notice the way he put it, according <clears throat> to your faith, be it unto you. In other words, if you really do believe, you're going to be healed. If you don't, you're not going to be healed. It's going to happen according to your faith. You know that every one of us here this morning are experiencing the truthfulness of that. But the sad part is that we're not believing that a lot of things could happen that could happen. That's our problem. We believe some things, we, we trust in some areas, but then there's other areas we don't trust. We don't believe. And it's always according to our faith, whether we're going to get it or not. So is there something that you see you don't have, but you know that God promised it, you know that a Christian ought to have it, but you don't have it? The issue is faith. But what we're looking at this morning is this group of people that John saw with rapture, they believed everything and they got everything. And he looks at a group of people that have received all the promises and he says, wow, this is amazing. But we are to be that group of people. So we must learn to trust God and to believe that he will fulfill his word. And then it says, and their eyes were open. So they actually believed and their eyes were open. Now, unfortunately, many times we're like the disciples. Jesus spoke to the whole crowd there as he was giving the Sermon on the Mount. And he said, those who worry about necessities, here's what he said about them. By necessities, I mean food, clothing, shelter, uh, just the basics that we have to have to live. And he says, if you, if you worry about those, he says, O oh, ye of little faith. Now, I don't know whether anybody this morning is worrying about the necessities of life. Sometimes even people that have a lot of money are worried that 20 years down the road, they'll not have the necessities. 
the poor people tend to learn that, you know, uh, I got them today, so I'll probably have them tomorrow, and he will take care of me. Uh, but <clears throat> he's saying, if you're like that, then you're a person of little faith. When they were in the storm on the sea, when Jesus was awakened and had calmed the sea, he said, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? So I don't find any record that he talks to his disciples about being people of great faith. Now later they were, uh, by the time they got to Pentecost, but not during the time when Jesus was training them. They were not people of great faith. And in another account, uh, in Mark 4, verse 40, it says, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? So in one he says, you're of little faith. And another one, he says, where is your faith? You don't have any faith. This is not a good compliment for a child of God. Wouldn't you agree? This is not where we need to be. And God doesn't want us to be there, and we don't have to be there. When Peter was walking on the water and for a moment took his eyes off of Jesus, Jesus said to him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? From Matthew 14, verse 31. So again, we find Peter just not really making use of the faith that he should have been using. Another time, Jesus was warning them about the leaven of the Pharisees, and they, they got mixed up, and they thought he was getting after them for not bringing some bread. And Jesus is re reminding them, don't you remember the 5,000 people that we fed with just a few loaves and fishes? So when they were worried that they hadn't brought bread, he said, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because ye have brought no bread? Matthew 16, 8. He's saying, listen, I could make all the bread we need. Don't worry that you didn't bring it. All of these accounts, we see a lack of faith. And I'm afraid that if we really are honest with ourselves as Seventh-day Adventists, that we are more like they were at this time, rather than like they were after Pentecost. But it's too late in Earth's history to be that way. It's time for us to become the kind of people of faith that John saw existed there as he witnessed the group of people, that 144,000 that had been made up from people that no doubt we know because, you know, that's going to be a group in our lifetime that's made up. Now, by contrast, <clears throat> there were two non-Jews that he made some amazing statements about. For instance, the centurion that had a servant that was sick and he heard about the power of Jesus, so he, <clears throat> he asked for Jesus to take care of the problem. But Jesus started to go to his house. He didn't plan on that. He felt too humble about Jesus coming to his house, so he went over to meet Jesus. And after his talk to Jesus, Jesus said, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. It's like saying, I haven't found this kind of faith in the Adventist church. That's kind of a, a sad statement, isn't it? He's saying throughout all of Israel, I, I didn't find this kind of faith. What was the man's faith? Well, if you read the story, he said, Jesus, you don't have to come to my house. The Jews always wanted him to come and touch the person and, you know. He said, you don't have to come. All you have to do is just speak the word. He'll get well. 
And he said, I'm familiar with that. I tell a soldier to go somewhere and do something, it gets done. Not he's in trouble, but, you know, it gets done. So that's all you have to do, Jesus. And Jesus said, wow, this is a man with great faith. Now, there is a lesson, I believe, in this. The less light we have, the easier it is to exercise faith. The more light we have, the harder it is to exercise faith. Why? Because there's so many things we're not claiming. You see, everything you don't claim weakens your faith. Everything you do claim strengthens your faith. And so if we have a lot of light, but we're not living up to it, then our faith is getting weaker. And here we find a man, he didn't have a lot of light, but what he did have, he really cherished it and he profited from it. And so he was a man of great faith. Also, there was this Canaanite woman that came quite a long distance to speak to Jesus. And we'll look at this story in more detail in a minute, but he said to her, O oh woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. Matthew 15, 28. So here's another non-Israelite, and they have great faith, and Jesus points out, trying to help all of us realize we can have it. I mean, God loves his special people. He loved the Jewish people. He would have given them up long before he did if he hadn't loved them. But the same is true of us. He loves Seventh-day Adventists with a special love. And he's saying, listen, you can have the kind of faith that these people have if you will just really make use of the faith that I've given you. And so I think this is a good text for us in Luke 17, verses 5 and 6. And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed. Now, if you've seen a grain of mustard seed, it's pretty small. Uh, one time I was in a class... <laughs> And I was talking about this, and someone said, well, I have some mustard seeds. So they brought them up. They are somewhere around the size of a carrot seed. Very, very small, but apparently when they're full grown, they're very big. And so the Lord said, if you even have as much faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto this sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root and be thou planted in the sea and it should obey you now i wonder how many of us would try that or would our faith be weak and we would say well we don't really think god would do that <laughs> we had a lifestyle guest one time and he read the other one where it talks about uh, say to this mountain be thou removed and it'll be gone and he said he was walking, he had just become a Christian, so he was out on his walk, and uh, he was reading the Bible, and he came across this text. And he thought, I should try this out. And right at the moment when he read the text, he saw this huge pile of dirt beside the road where he was walking. And so he said, uh, be gone. And I thought, wow, you know, that was really foolish of him. But, you know, he's a new Christian. He just doesn't understand. That's what I was thinking in my mind. Well, he went on with his story. He said, the next day I came by the same place, and he said the whole pile was gone. And for him, it confirmed that that verse in the Bible is really true. Now, of course, I, I realized God didn't, he wasn't talking about a real mountain. He was talking about a mountain of problems, a mountain of difficulties, that they can be removed by faith. But God honored that man's faith because he didn't know that that's what God was talking about. Isn't that interesting? 
<clears throat> Hebrews 12.2 gives a very important thought. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now, that's talking specifically about the faith in the sense of the belief system that we have gotten from the Bible. He's the author of it. He's the finisher of it. But I thought, you know, he also is the author of faith, the faith that lays hold of the promises of God. And he's also the finisher of that as well. So I believe there's an application there, double application. And then we have this one from Romans 12, verse 3. And it says, God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. So no one can say, I don't have any faith. When God gives a measure, I'm sure he gives more than a mustard seed. Wouldn't you agree? More than a mustard seed. He gives a measure of faith to everyone. Now the question is, faith is like a muscle. If you don't use your muscle, you just sit around all day and you don't exercise and so on, your muscles are very weak. But if you are exercising, your muscles get strong and they can do more. I had a grandfather, he, he was too old by the time I knew him to realize what strength he had, but he was known as the strongest man in the neighborhood. And, you know, to demonstrate their strength, they would pick up these huge boulders. And he could always pick up the biggest boulder of anybody in the whole neighborhood. So, uh, you know, that's the kind of faith that we are to have. By exercising that measure of faith, even if we started out with just a grain of mustard seed, we exercise the faith and it makes a difference in our life. If we have problems in our marriage, if we have problems at work, if we have uh, financial problems, or it doesn't matter where the problems exist for the Christian, if they will believe that God has an answer. Now, it isn't always the answer that we want, but he always has an answer. And we can trust him to supply the answer. But then, what about becoming like Jesus? We all face problems in that, right? We have to admit we're not like him yet. There's this in the way. There's that that hasn't happened yet. And the other things, and maybe we even see other people and they have some of those changes that haven't happened in us. And we start thinking, oh, I sure wish I was like them. You can be. You, faith will bring it to anybody. And you know, the good part about it is, it doesn't matter where you start. You can still get there. I would guess that some of that 144,000, when they started out, were among some of the worst sinners on earth. But through faith, they conquered it all. And they overcame all the problems, including facing death and whatever else was in their path. And so they became that special group. Now let's look at this Canaanite woman. What, what kind of test did she have to face to really demonstrate the kind of faith she had? Well, the first test is in Matthew 15, 23. She came, she made her request, she heard the disciples, uh, <clears throat> I guess this happened before she <coughs> heard them. But <coughs> she makes a request of Jesus. <coughs> and it says, but he answered her not a word. If you come to somebody and they appear to ignore you, most of us, we give up right there. And we'd say, well... I guess he's not going to help us. And that's the way it seems when we pray. When we claim promises of God, it seems like at first that he's not paying attention to us. And so we quit. 
we, we give up. We don't expect he's going to do it for us. I think that's why this story is in here. Then she kept on asking. She wouldn't give up. And so in verse 24, Jesus said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In other words, you're a foreigner. I've been sent to help the Israelites. Now that wasn't the actual meaning of Jesus. She was a lost sheep of the house of Israel. But the disciples didn't understand that, and she probably didn't understand it either. And so it was a uh, like a rebuke. Well, I haven't come to help you. I've just come to help the Israelites. But she still doesn't give up. And so then she says, after Jesus is saying, well, you know, we don't give the bread to the, to the dogs. But she says, uh, he said to her, it is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. Now, I don't know what it was like in those days. I know in this country people think upon dogs pretty highly. But I don't think that's the way they thought about that back then. In a lot of countries, they don't. I mean, a dog is like, if he gets killed, so what? Or, you know, if he's sick, so what? Uh, they don't care about dogs. And that's sort of the attitude you pick up in the Bible. And so here, it's like she's being called a dog. But she had the spirit of Job. In Job 13, 15, when he said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Now that's the kind of faith that the 144,000 have developed and that is seen by the Apostle John in this group. And he says, When they could put their finger on a promise of God, they would not give up until they received what he asked them. And especially this is important in regard to our character. To conquer the weaknesses that we have, those inherited, those cultivated tendencies to evil that exist in our life, the people that will be like this woman. And even if you fell again, you don't give up. You ask again. And you do not stop asking until you have the complete victory over that weakness. And we see that it is true because John witnessed the group that had conquered everything and they were obedient to everything. They were like Jesus, ready to inherit the kingdom of heaven. And so it's not just, I hope so, it's not just maybe it can happen, it's a reality. But what is it that makes it a reality? It's faith. And so God is wanting us to develop that faith now. And every time we have a need, that's another opportunity to develop that faith, which says, I will not give up until I have the victory over this. I'm not going to give up. In uh, Galatians, I guess I forgot to put the verse down here, but I think it's Galatians 3.26. It says, Knowing that a man is not justified, but I like the simpler word, pardoned, knowing that a man is not pardoned by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be pardoned by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So this group of people in Revelation 14, 12, they have been fully justified, fully pardoned. And here it explains how we get it. Once we sin, once we mess up, 
No amount of obedience can take care of that. You can't erase it. Once it's done, it's done. My mother used to tell me, don't cry over spilled milk. You know, once it's uh, spilled out, what can you do? You just have to get some more. And yet, we have to have a perfect record to get into heaven. And so Jesus has a plan. If we believe in him, he takes care of it. But that's not all. There are two things in this justification or pardon. And the first one is that he changes our desires. In other words, he's not going to change the record if we still want to sin. So the first thing he does is change our desires. And then he can also change the record. So that now we have the perfect record of Jesus in place of our own record. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people come to him and ask for that, but they go away not believing they got it. And so they're not really, it doesn't really happen because they didn't believe it. It's according to our faith that it will happen. There's a short sentence in the book Steps to Christ, and it's very powerful. It says, it is so if we believe it. We could put it the other way. If we do not believe it, it is not so. But this group of people have believed that it was so, and it became a reality. But then, we know that justification is not enough, pardon is not enough, we have to be sanctified. Here's an interesting statement. It'll give the reference in a moment. We cannot claim perfection of the flesh. We may have Christian perfection of the soul. So the promptings to sin are going to be there until we get our immortal body. We can't, we can't change that. That's going to be there. But what we can have is perfection of the soul. Through the sacrifice made in our behalf, sins may be perfectly forgiven. Our dependence is not in what man can do. It is in what God can do for man through Christ. When we surrender ourselves wholly to God and fully believe, the blood of Christ cleanses from how much sin? All. All sin. The conscience can be freed from condemnation through faith in his blood. All may be made perfect in Christ Jesus. But it doesn't stop there. That's probably mostly about justification. But it no doubt includes both. Thank God, this is from Second Selected Messages 32. Thank God that we are not dealing with impossibilities. We may claim, and notice this time it says sanctification. We may enjoy the favor of God. So we get justification or pardon by faith, and we get Christ-likeness by faith also. We may enjoy the favor of God. We are not to be anxious about what Christ and God think of us, but about what God thinks of Christ, our substitute. Many of us think way too much about how bad we are and how impossible it seems for us to gain the victory over everything. We think too much about that. That hinders us from gaining the victory. But when we think about this, we are not to be anxious about what Christ and God think of us, but about what God thinks of Christ, our substitute. Ye are accepted in the beloved. The Lord shows to the repenting, believing one that Christ accepts the surrender of the soul to be molded and fashioned after his own likeness. 
So he will not stop. I mean, we can hinder him, we can say no, and the biggest way we say no is by not believing it can happen. But if we don't say no, and we keep on believing, he will produce in us his own likeness, the likeness of Jesus. From the book Christ Object Lessons, page 311, it says, When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart. The will is merged in his will. The mind becomes one with his mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity to him. And notice what it says. We live his life. Now, if we just say, well, you know, my past record just shows that that'll never happen to me. It's not possible for me to be like that. According to your faith, be it unto you. You won't get it with that attitude. But if you believe that you can have it, not because you deserve it, not because you've been good enough, no. It's not based on any of those things. It's based solely upon your need. You need to have it, and he has promised it, and if you believe it, it will happen. It, it might not happen as fast as you would hope, but it will happen. If you are like Job or like this Canaanite woman. This is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness. Then, as the Lord looks upon us, he sees not the fig leaf garment, not the nakedness and deformity of sin, but his own robe of righteousness, which is perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah. Now, this is talking about both justification, because once you've messed up, the only way you can take care of the past is by pardon. But this one is also talking about the present, that not only have you been pardoned for everything you did wrong, but you have been changed into the likeness of Christ. And so now you wear his robe. Why is it his? Because all the power came from him. Why is it that we can expect this to be? Well, in Genesis 1.1, it says God created the heaven and the earth. In other words, he created everything. Now today, some people are tarnishing the word create. But correctly understood, the word create means to make something out of nothing. And so, you know, to a limited degree, we create. For instance, uh, I made a, a desk that my wife uses. And I took some wood and I, I did a lot of work on it and made a desk. Well, but I didn't start with nothing because human beings can't start with nothing. But God is able to start with nothing. And one of the most powerful proofs of this is a, a professor who got kicked out for his discovery but he discovered <clears throat> that in rocks, there are little halos of radiation that have been captured in the rock. And the only way they could be there is if the rock came into existence instantaneously because radioactivity disappears very rapidly. And so that, he calls the name of his book, Creation's Tiny Mystery, that shows that God created the rocks. He didn't start with rocks. He started with nothing. Well, if God can create out of nothing, can't he give you a beautiful character out of nothing? Can he accomplish what needs to be done in your life if we believe that he can do it? Also in Psalm 33, verse 6 and 9, it says, by the word of the Lord. Now the Bible is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> By the word of the Lord 
were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Jesus doesn't even have to come down. All he has to do is speak a word from heaven. And if we have the faith of the centurion, we will be healed because he said so. His word has creative energy. And one more in Isaiah 65, 17, looking to the future, he says, I create new heavens and a new earth. All over again, he creates. And as we look at the fact that he is the creator, we look at what he did for those that exercise faith, we are to believe. Yes, we could become a part of the 144,000. We could conquer every problem that gets in our way, whatever it may be, we can conquer all the weaknesses that we have. And the proof is Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is a group of people that had it happen. Why not believe that it could be you? That it could be me? That's what God wants us to do. And I believe if we will trust him and claim those promises, that we will not be disappointed. It will be accomplished according to what he wants to do in every person.